and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, and I am the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Data-Centric Infrastructure for Agile Development, sponsored today by Mark Logic. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce our speaker for today, Jim Clark. Jim is the Senior Director of Product Management at MarkLogic. Primary focus areas include financial services and Hadoop strategies. For joining MarkLogic, Jim was on the executive staffs of various big data startups in the Bay Area, and prior to that, he spent 14 years at Oracle in various product management positions. And that, I will give the floor to Jim to start the presentation. Hello and welcome. Hey, you can hear me okay? Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for the introduction, Shannon. Uh, today, uh, I'd like to take you through uh, what we're calling the data center to data center uh, in, in roughly two parts. Um, and I think, uh, interestingly enough for me, um, both of these parts uh, somewhat map my career uh, from uh, when I started at Oracle and in my transition um, through the various big data startups and now to MarkLogic. So uh, I speak from experience uh, as we go through a few of these scenarios. Uh, as Shannon mentioned, uh, or maybe she didn't, but um, we'll take questions at the end. And, and what I will say is that if there's anything that I can't answer specifically today, uh, I will offer uh, people to follow up with me directly, and I will get the information that they need. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so today, uh, if you look at the world, it's uh, very application-centric. Um, I mentioned before, uh, you know, in my career, uh, I really had two parts. I uh, started uh, my career at a large relational database company. Um, where part of the benefit there is one could move around organizations fairly freely, which provided me a lot, a lot of opportunity to experience many aspects of the enterprise database and ERP businesses, both producer of product and as a consumer of the dog food we produced. Um, Typical uh, life cycle from a data-centric applications uh, process is uh, the first step is you design the application, uh, determine the data that you need, determine the queries that you need, design the scheme and indexing strategy, build the base, the ETL strategy, load the, data, load the application, and change, re repeat steps one, one through eight. Uh, that's a pretty typical flow. Something I experienced uh, while I was at Oracle and uh, other companies as I moved forward. Um, the challenge here is, and particularly when I was at Oracle, is at a certain point in time uh, around the early 2000s, Oracle started acquiring companies. And they were uh, a mix of both small companies and large companies. At the time, uh, while I was at Oracle, we were managing a lot of our support systems and contract systems. And this was a very familiar scenario. When an acquisition occurred, we had to take the company's data, customer records, contacts, and try to organize them into our existing infrastructure. Uh, we repeated steps one through eight new times, trying to fit this into a relational database in the schema. It became very challenging, and uh, we were not able to innovate as we move forward because we spent all of our time just trying to integrate those new customers and the information that they provided. I'll give you an example here of kind of what the high-level architecture looks like. It all started out with a simple OLTP system run your business. It's flexible enough to run the transactions and reporting requirements. When you needed to grow, you were to check for some better hardware and some extra database licenses. But in scale, those quarter-end reports the books or by marketing campaigns would bring the OLT environment to a crawl. Extra seconds of latency could mean lost revenue, so the solution was to create a new environment specifically designed to aggregate reporting. The warehouse would require a dimensional view of data or some ETL to get the right data out from the OLTP system periodically. 
the design of the warehouse served very well for the original reporting requirements. However, with more data, data think of increasingly clever ways to ask of it. You didn't have a plan for a particular dimension or your enterprise data warehouse schema. You typically have to sign up for a dedicated environment with its own representation of the data. These were in the dozens or may not be controlled by central IT or a W owner. Dicing and dicing comes more bespoke DTLs. At a scale, writing increasingly large to your database, warehouse, and storage vendors becomes unsustainable. In order to maintain some predictability of costs and performance for online systems, you institute an archival process. Period, the older data is aged out into offline cold storage from the OLTP and warehouse environments. This is particularly tricky because you have to get just the right size rights traversing all the relationships among the tables. Data is all about the context of the transaction, and a bank, its customers, and instruments managing enterprise-wide reference data creates new relationships and dependencies across the data model. You can see it's very complicated. Additional complexity with each environment has to correct data for its authorized use, and corrections and modifications propagate throughout the system. Additional complexity, additional complexity make sure each environment has the correct data for authorized Sorry, I just said it. And then each new business line or acquired company, this process repeats itself. Most of these organizations will come to disparate systems for many particular types of unstructured information under an enterprise search umbrella. So this was pretty typical of what we experienced at Oracle. Um, it became very challenging, daunting, and in some cases, uh, what we decided to do is just keep the customer systems that we acquired online through an ETL process, which didn't lend itself to um, any sort of real-time analysis, uh, a lot of latency, and uh, I think till, still today there's challenges in those types of environments. So some questions we would ask is, you know, how do you determine in advance what's useful? Love the application. Can you go back and include the data from 1990 to 1995? Do you be copying for every new application? This is what happens pretty consistently have to go back and move the data around, organize it in a different way for it to be useful. DTL consumes all resources. Um, this is uh, something we experienced firsthand. Uh, anytime a new data type comes in or a new data source, have to either uh, add a new ETL pipe or modify the existing one that's in place today. Too many technologies. Um, in heterogeneous environments, uh, it's very challenging to try and organize those technologies and come up with a standard reference architecture to manage things going forward. Too, much, too many old copies. We've lost control. We don't know where the master data records are. Uh, trying to manage that is a challenge in and of itself. So that kind of uh, overview of the application-centric data center, uh, another way to look at it is HDC, uh, or ways to hide it out. So I'll leave that visual up there as I sort of transition into where um, I kind of moved to throughout my career and experience kind of the change into more of a data-centric data center. While Oracle uh, working on the integration through acquisition, uh, we were doing a lot of things in terms of organizing uh, what we now call as big data. Uh, different data types were coming in from different customers, uh, customers such as, uh, that we acquired, such as PeopleSoft and Siebel. There were a lot of smaller companies as well that were part of that acquisition treadmill. And uh, as I mentioned in my slides before, it just became a daunting challenge trying to integrate that. Um, we, in some ways, had an advantage in that we had all the software capabilities we needed working at Oracle, but also it was a limitation. Interesting enough, when we were at Oracle doing this, we realized that there was actually a pretty big business opportunity out of the context of relational databases and managing a data-centric environment. And a number of us left and started our uh, own company. Um, and called it a, a, a company for big data solutions. At the time, that name had not uh, been tagged. So uh, it was something where we were just managing um, non-relational content. These things that we designed were focused toward enterprise and a degree of dif difficulty managed on the cloud. It was SaaS-based, 
and we targeted initially towards enterprise software companies. Uh, through the course of managing this company, we pivoted to a financial, financial services industry, uh, specifically focusing on buy-side and sell-side analytics firms. Our focus became squarely on the data and how do we unlock its real value to customers in a flat, flexible, real manner and ensuring it was secure. And it wasn't something necessarily at the time we consciously designed against, but hanging our own shingle, sing, shingle and working with other people's money and having to be extremely nimble and responsive to customers and cons of cost, we just couldn't deploy in the applica application-centric model and continue to exist. Uh, we had to look at another way to approach this. In this section, what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe a shift to a more data-centric orientation in the data center. And what feels like move towards a standard uh, configuration or reference architecture so we can explore the ever, the ever dynamic customer needs and a way of turning the existing model on its head. Sorry. So the application approach was based around traditional relational databases, and it really hasn't been able to keep up with the new types and volumes of data that we all see out there in the marketplace today. Infrastructure that's designed around the specific location makes it difficult to accommodate change. Adding a new data source means adjusting the entire stack from top to bottom, where it's, where it's made assumptions about the entire scope of the, or the requirements. A new that we'll call the data center, data set, data centric data center has emerged. The DCDC DC provides a central place to accommodate data of all shapes and sizes, and then late find structures or schemas only when you need it. This is to maintain all the rich context around your data that you may not have known or cared about when you collected it, give, giving you the flexibility to adjust as you learn. And the areas I'll cover is uh, part of what we see as, as a rest architecture is, uh, includes a dupe, um, some low storage capabilities, Elasticity, how does the data life cycle? Um, all data is valuable, but some is more valuable than others based on time, based on business need. Uh, the ability to do this processing on press or cloud or both, uh, to bring power data services to the fold when it's needed, uh, to provide a complete database platform that powers all this, having enterprise ready capabilities included in it. That was just describing Hadoop. Uh, part of the data-centric data center, Hadoop is a really key part for us. Google's general use case, of course, was aggregating all the messy data from the web to provide an analytic sandbox for building search indexes and selling ads. As the ecosystem matures, more mainstream companies are looking to leverage Hadoop went along in some cases instead of the legacy data management infrastructure to provide more, more flexibility. It has three particularly strong use cases in the enterprise. Because Hadoop can accommodate any shape of, uh, any of data relatively cheaply, it's often used to store raw data and to process it for downstream analysis. Having an economical place to put large volumes of low marginal value data has changed and how we think about it, rather than aggregating quickly and discarding the inputs or data that doesn't necessarily fit into the existing infrastructure, Duke makes it possible to keep all this data around. This is a traditional transformation and cleanup, but also things like sessionalization or logs or join enormous data sets on the fly. One way it is staged, the Duke provides a reliable storage on commodity hard hardware. Built in application makes the storage highly available and locally provide performance for large sequential I.O. Your enterprise capabilities like role-based security and encryption added to Hadoop to its core. To its core. Finally, Hadoop provides sophisticated distributed computation designed to work well with its distributed storage model. This is helpful for building large-scale predictive models or aggregating across a population. With new distributed storage and computation at your disposal, you still need a way to reach your end users. This is do interactive queries and granular updates, a way to operationalize insights derived from Hadoop in an application, a way that doesn't compromise the flexibility that Hadoop offers. And because it's at its core, Hadoop is a file system. Hadoop can handle many 
different types of data with ha having to predefine the shape of the data or the quiz will be executed against it. This provides a flexible, albeit arcane, to write queries that cross a terabyte or even a petabyte of data without having to be a distributed systems expert. And we are working with uh, various Hadoop distributions and partners today uh, to certify against our platform, and we continue to to uh, work with them closely as we provide solutions out to the marketplace. So moving on to the database, why must we choose? Latency queries and granularity, granular updates, of course, require a database. A alone is not equipped for this type of workload. Popular tech press will have you think that to start right off between legacy relational databases and the popular new open source NoSQL, what do you have the best of both of these worlds, the flexibility and scalability of NoSQL along with the reliability and security organizations that have come to trust in mature relational database. That's what we contend is enterprise NoSQL. NoSQL provides a flexible mo data model and comprehensive indexes. And the document model empowers developers more in line with the domain model of an app few layers of, of abstraction. One of the defining features of most NoSQL systems is a flexible, flexible data model, more flexible than its relational friends. Energy in the NoSQL movement has been around the flexible schemas empowering developers. The SQLess data model has been touted as more in line with the domain model of an application with fewer layers of, of, of abstraction. For example, a patient visit a lab result, a lab result in a healthcare application is likely coming in a document and a significant portion of the workflow and the application logic likely also treats the patient visit as an atomic whole. The the thin rich contextual documents makes developing applications faster and easier. Letting and marshalling awkward ORM. It's that you don't have to do any data modeling, it's just that you can find your data modeling as you need to support a particular business process or analysis. However, schema on the document data model really shines in data integration. By not having to declare a rigid data model up front, you get the flexibility to load any shape of data. A well thought indexing strategy will allow you to slice and dice based on the semantics of the data itself. In this scenario, all of your data may in fact end up being consumed. What NoSQL does is allow you to evolve from an unstructured, sparse NMS data without having to sacrifice consistency along the way. of how enterprise NoSQL and our case mark logic interacts with Hadoop. Hadoop is a heavy lifting petabytes of raw and indexed data. NoSQL on Hadoop is a shared infrastructure, provides low latency queries and granular updates. Logic is deployed directly on the Hadoop file system. Data files sit side by side with other data in HDFS. There's a single pool storage, availability, durability that comes with HDFS. It really mounts to a mark logic data co-located with Hadoop nodes or on its own dedicated infrastructure. One that's immediately available for query and update with full security. Next generation architecture, Hadoop sits at the foundation. It's responsible for the heavy lifting across petabytes of raw and indexed data. NoSQL deployed on top of Hadoop, like MarkLogic, takes advantage of the shared infrastructure to provide latency queries, grant updates for interactive applications. Mark will be deployed directly on top of HDFS. As Mark stores and indexes data, its zip files sit by, side by side with other data in HDFS, providing a single storage to manage and all availability and durability that comes with HDFS. For real time queries and granular updates, you can mount these data files to a MarkLogic database, either co located with Hadoop nodes or on an infrastructure. Mounting quickly takes seconds. When mounted, this data is available for immediate queries and updates without changes to the application code. So we see this as complementary approaches. By finding Hadoop and Enterprise NoSQL, you get a flexible, scalable platform for building today's applications with today and tomorrow, today's and tomorrow's data. By simplifying the overall stack and reducing the number of schema changes and ETL hops, you also reduce the opportunities for your demand management to get data of compliance. The data center, data center. 
is storage. Trends and talent challenges need to be addressed. Continued investment in Dupe and moving into production. Continued investment in Dupe and moving into production more and more. But many organizations aren't seen to the value to do that investment today. It does have great promise, but harnessing the potential capabilities has just been inside the grasp of operational teams because software couldn't easily adapt. As your data volumes grow, the cost of storage is faster than budgets. You say storage is cheap. Organizations need to figure out the best storage for their data. They really need a storage strategy and to, and to ensure that it's still usable in a timely manner. There are three we set out to address in Mark Logic, and we'll be helping our customers achieve greater, greater performance. I'll take you through some tiered storage examples here. With storage, you can get important data readily available for sub-second performance to make your finance team by leveraging the cost-effective cloud platforms to back up your data. It's available for compliance officers to give your data scientists a place to perform analysis. You can improve governance, compliance, security policies over the entire lifetime of your data. Market allows you to store data across different types of storage. This in itself is not a new capability as database and storage vendors have been offering this hierarchical storage information lifecycle management for years. Differentiates our offering is the ability to easily and consistently move data between tiers without complicated and expensive ETLs. The duplication. In months where it's first ingested, and Crane leverages those indexes for search analytics no matter where it's stored today. By allowing you to live at the most appropriate tier of the infrastructure, you can save money while providing appropriate performance and availability for applications. Align storage strategy with the value and use of your data allows you to make smarter trade-offs among cost, performance, and availability. You can implement data governance policy and deploy Marjic data using a fluid mix of SSD, local disk, shared disk, and the, and the dupe distributed file system, as well as Amazon EBS and S3. Tier storage allows you to align your infrastructure costs with your business objectives. For example, you can provide service level agreements in a single system decrease costs of ETL bring off, to bring offline content back to online, and power operations team without imposing burdens on your developers. Here's tier storage. You go to find the data tiers based on a range index, have it balanced into what we call force by tier, move your tier to different storage, Tier or another tier or both at once, and all with no downtime and 100% consistency. It's the executable, same APIs on all these tiers, so you can write one app that run across them seamlessly and transparently. The phase of our tiered storage roadmap is the ability to read MarLogic data file without having, having to first mount the database. We have vectors today that allow you to run map reduced jobs in the MarLogic database. These require you to go through the front door, stand up a mark logic instance, and query through the Eden node. That's great. If you need our indexes and security model, but too much overhead, you don't need. Not all analysis needs sub-second response time. By getting access to that data to a specific server process, we also get the web vendor lock in. Update to this connector that we just up, that we just shipped is called direct access. It allows any Java application, and especially MapReduce jobs, to get the data out of Mark Logic without first mount the database. Our indexes are security modeling, accessing the data this way. You get a long-term archival format and an efficient way to stream across the data with MapReduce. So let's look at the use case and how practices have been used. This is an example that came from the banking world that they're very sensitive about their IT infrastructure. They often feel is their competitive advantage. So I've anonymized both this example and have pulled together a composite of several banks. Both the example show today are in action in roughly the shape that I've described. Derivatives trading business, front of the systems actually execute the trades. 
systems are very, very widely and have evolved with acquisitions and out in innovation that come up with new financial instruments to change. Things don't stay still, they continue to move forward, um, particularly around uh, acquisitions, people trying to innovate with the environment. This, this evolution uh, typically has taken a very application-centric approach. For each real asset type, there's separate back office infrastructure support, all the post-trading processing, so clearing and settlement, and all the processes that need the and state graces of the regulators. This wasn't an intentional design, but pragmatic evolution over many years. However, it resulted in a patchwork of loose connected data islands with brittle EL processes gluing them together. A key question the bank needs to be able to answer is, given all the trades we've just executed, what are my obligations? The impacts just about every aspect of their business. So the challenges that uh, this customer presented to us and we were able to work with and help solve is long term cycles to provide new instrument types to the marketplace, long complex combinations of ETL and data models. Uh, they have or had very limited visibility across their business, what was going on. Um, with all the regulations that have been passed through legislation, there were governance, governance risk, maintenance costs, and siloed infrastructure. They had varied SLAs and access patterns, which created inefficiency. The architecture is the complexity and the difficulty of changing anything. Changing anything. The amount of time it takes to model a new financial instrument has been a significant drain on the bank's ability to innovate. By the time application infrastructure is ready to rule out, six or 12 months later, the meaning of the marketplace may have passed. The complexity of independent EDL and data models not only makes application development difficult, but it adds significant risk. For example, in 2008, it wasn't immediately clear what the bank's actual exposure to Lehman Brothers was because the data was spread out among many systems. With a complete picture of risk, they're often forced to withhold capital that could otherwise be doing something more productive in the marketplace. Finally, scaling each infrastructure was difficult operationally and provided an inconsistent quality of service. So the, excuse me, was to realize was in reason their data modeling didn't actually accommodate the realities of their business. But if, unlike securities or complex transactions, or collects contracts that vary widely by instrument. The work is also inherently document-based. In the structure, the would receive contracts and cash flows as documents, in relational tables, and then reassemble them as hierarchical objects in their applications. This object relational mapping is not a new problem. There are many tools to manage this complexity. The rigid nature of the relational model makes change to the data model very difficult at either end. It would take months to introduce new instruments. From the agility of their traders to take advantage of market opportunities, working the documents throughout meant a lot of a lot less plumbing and fewer opportunities for error. The rigidity probably looks a lot like your original document, except without all the original content. If you had to model every piece of content context in a relational schema, you'd end up something with something complicated and brittle. We're not that every everything can be modeled as a document, but there are clear things that can be easily modeled as normalized tables. In a document database, if I mark up a provenance of a particular piece of data, I don't need to change my database schema. I can that up in line and continue to move forward with it. In adopting the data-centric approach was the ability to accommodate multiple SLAs. Not all data should be treated equally. In an organization, a small amount of data accounts for most value. For example, current transactions are the latest news. This data requires high availability, interactive response times. However, the, however as the data ages, a long, long tail, it, its patterns change. The story data is typically not that you keep running keep run your business on. You may need to keep it on for regulatory compliance reporting, but it's not likely some, it's 
not something that needs millisecond interactivity or highly available. Economically, it makes sense to more pack this data off on cheaper storage. The economics of storage and compute have allowed organizations to keep the long tail around. Much of the data may not need to be online immediately or queryable, but should be accessible to quickly spin up for analysis, then fund down again to conserve or compute resources. how this plays out in our composite bank. This data would be highly available for query granular update. Performance is key, but predictability of performance is just as important. So these were in transactions in the last 120 days. So it shows as the current data falls out of the active window, it doesn't require the same amount of availability and performance guarantees of the active data. I still needed to keep it around, keep it around as for historical transactions and, and importing phone, email, and message re uh, records for regulators. They able to access data, this data, but typically in seconds or minutes, not milliseconds. This allows them to be more densely packed and uh, in cheaper storage. In addition to the data you need to keep around for compliance, they also have the ability Access to the very long tail to unleash their data scientists. This they might be able to recognize the patterns of fraud or develop new trading or risk models. The analysis isn't necessarily done up front, but they want the raw puts around to accommodate new ideas to quickly to quick or to account for the context they hadn't understood when they first collected the data. So this cheaper, reliable storage and large scale compute infrastructure is ideal for this. Run an entire petabyte live for real time query, there's a pool of 10 hosts to accommodate ad hoc analysis, grab the gigabyte or terabyte subset of data you're interested in, mount a database, run analysis, and tear it down, all without moving the data from where it resides in HDFS. A system that's constantly changing. The key is to keep the performance predictability in the active tier and costs low in the compliance and analytic tier while being able to easily and reliably move to the most appropriate environment. As this approach, you're able to allocate the most expensive infrastructure to the most important data while keeping the long tail and raw and pins around for compliance or analysis. We call this tier storage. Of course, database vendors have been selling this concept concept that's here to hierarchical storage for a long time. Which makes this approach different is documents throughout. The benefit of multiple storage tiers without having to go all in on relational views of the world and integrating with the do. You want to be able to align the infrastructure with objectives. Volumes are increasing, but IT budgets are not. Tiers allows you to align your objectives is all data is valuable given a period of time, some is more valuable than others. So down this portion is, you know, as we are able to optimize storage and be able to organize value data through tiers, uh, it enables folks to save money. Um, they're still able to enforce their data governance and data is always available. in the decentric data center is elasticity. Challenges that need to be addressed are continued investment in Hadoop and moving into production more and more, but many organizations aren't seeing enough value from that investment. That elasticity. Elasticity can help you know when to scale, how much to scale, and programmatically expand and contract premise or in the cloud. With elasticity, we provide the tools to understand in detail how your cluster is performing and how to find, and find bottlenecks in that performance. We provide grain tuning parameters, option of indexes, and cache sizes, etc. 
orchestration APIs to expand and contract clusters, clusters programmatically on-prem in the cloud. And we provide continuing online re rebalancing of content across the nodes and to keep performance optimal for your cluster size. If you know your system, you can harness it by using the cloud and be more proactive with SLAs and be able to manage to compliance. So if we put these together, the data center, data center, you can once we have a security model, provide transactions when you need them, there's a data model that's available where you add more different types of data from different sources and not have to change the schema. We have elastic operations where you can go on demand and pull data and, and, and sequet off when you need to. And we provide simplified governance. So Mark provides these additional benefits. With Mark Logic, you can use a dupe as a share file system store here or mix batch with MapReduce and provide real-time workloads. Drive an enterprise database for real-time search, delivery, and analytics. Let a dupe investment without compromising enterprise capabilities, secure HADR transactions, duplication and ETL to gain agility and reduce risk. Compare storage to dynamically. Data backups, binaries, archives, access to archive, archive index segment directly via MapReduce. It currently supports Clutter, including Apache Hadoop, and distribution for Apache Hadoop. And we continue to move forward with partnerships. So, from a level across the data centric data center, um, we have three categories that we like to focus on. We provide, uh, deliver more value, build more powerful applications. With agility, we can prepare and respond quickly to change. And trusted, our database has asset compliance. A lot of the relational databases, uh, we have the additional ability to provide that flexibility to build applications in a quick and more seamless manner and be able to address the, the ever-changing needs of the marketplace. So the days. Um, new, new more data is both an opportunity and it's a threat in the IT center today. Um, the last generation of data management really is not sufficient to be flexible and to be able to address the needs of the business. Uh, more and representations, transformations increase risk and slow innovation. Uh, as I uh, stated in my example earlier, um, particularly through acquisitions or if you're just trying to load new data sources to expand the value of your business. Um, with the solutions that and uh, reference architecture that I just described, you can ask once and re read across workloads and the life cycle of the data. No equal provide indexing and updates for interactive apps, do provide staging and persistence for analytics. I think that is my last slide. So I think I kind of end early, but I can entertain questions if people have questions at this point. And there are any questions that I am not able to answer on the phone, I am more than happy to take those back and get more information from any of you. Thank you so much for this great presentation. And uh, I'll give everyone a minute here to answer some questions. We already have one that's come in. Uh, and just to let I remind everybody, one of the most popular questions that we always get is if they'll receive a copy of the slides in the presentation. And I'll be sending that out within two business days. So by end of day Monday, uh, you should get an email from me with uh, links to the slides and the recording of the presentation. 
We have one question coming in here. Uh, does Mark Logic provide replication between node residing in data centers on multiple continents? How to perform on high latency connect? Well, there's, let's start with that one. There's several questions built into the into one. Or I'll, let me read it all, and then you can start with the one. Um, does it perform on high latency connections, and how does it handle a conflict resolution after a long-lived disconnection between nodes? Does it depend on ACID? Um, you know, I'm going to have to defer that to get, I don't want to answer this slightly incorrectly, so I'm going to, if I could take that question offline and get back to the person who asked it directly, um, I would feel comfortable with that, because uh, I think it's probably a bit more of a detailed answer than um, is in my area of expertise right now. So if they don't mind doing that, that I would uh, be more than willing to get back with them personally. Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, I believe, um, yeah, so we can we can certainly move on from there. Uh, any other questions? Gabriel says no problem, no rush. Uh, that was the only question we haven't come in so far. Everyone's pretty quiet today. I don't know if it's end of the week or what. Um, if you have a couple of other questions, any other questions? And there was one question about uh, if we get confirmation that we took the course. Actually, uh, if you need confirmation that you if you took the course, feel free to email me, Shannon, at dataversity.net, and I'll get you a certifi certifi uh, certificate to acknowledge that you took the course if you're looking to um, uh, get educational credits for a certification or school. Um, and we have a question here, another question. Do you, um, are you able to discuss MarkLogic's asset support? Yeah, and I, we we provide acid capabilities. Um, I'm not sure if you know if there's any nuance in terms of maybe there's more of a follow-up question to that. Yeah, we we do. We are acid certified. Um, we provide all those capabilities within our database. I think I'll mention um, a little bit of history of Mark Logic. So we've been around for about 12 years. I think uh, one of the presets of the design of the database, uh, the founder and CTO came from an enterprise environment, so ACID compliancy was designed as part of the uh, initial architecture of the database, so we've had that all along. Uh, I know there's other NoSQL databases out there, um, particularly in the open source space, that uh, do have that capability today, but uh, we are certified ACID compliant, um, various boards, and uh, one of our marketplaces is, is the U.S. government who's certified us as ACID compliant. So I hope that answers the question. If there's more detail, I can follow up. Sure, absolutely. No, that's great. Um, do you support uh, in-memory storage? Um, I'll have a look on that. Okay. And this to be it for the questions right now. Let me see if there's any more that's coming in. I'll give people a few minutes. Um, you want to mention about uh, Mark Logic? I think uh, you know we've we've been around for 12 years. I've been at Mark Logic for uh, uh, coming on, on seven months now. Um, like I said before, my transition from Oracle into uh, startups, we ended up in in the NoSQL space kind of mistake. And you know, I really see the value of that, and was more of a frustration of, of, of we're limited with. And, and when I was working at Oracle with the relational model, um, you know, I think that this is you know, I, people ask me um, what's the difference between the the, the data market today versus what it was uh, back in the early Oracle days, and then I, almost this is as kind of a, a, a generation where there was the relational database battles with uh, Oracle. And, uh, 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 Do and Informix and all those, and then probably about 30 or 40 others we can't remember anymore because they faded. Uh, the SQL space I think is very similar to, to that um, where it was back then. I think the challenges in the marketplace with uh, the social media, uh, the, how data is now center to a lot of the businesses that we interact with, and, and certainly uh, the business I was in before, uh, being able to have a flexible solution that does have enterprise capabilities and uh, enables uh, the customer or um, the consumer 
to, to be able to quickly run applications to serve the needs of the business is, is really important. And uh, Marfic, I think, is one of those companies that uh, is on the forefront, along with uh, a few others, that's helping address those needs. And we did have another question come in. Um, how is data model? How do data modeling practices change in NoSQL and a Hadoop environment? I have to follow up on that one as well. I apologize. I don't want to answer that directly. None. Uh, Looks like those are all the questions we have for you today. Uh, I will be sure and get you those questions, Jim, so you can follow up with the uh, with everybody appropriately. We can include it in the follow up email, and even if you want, um, that'll go out again on Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording of the session. Uh, anything else you want to add before we go? And um, yeah, again, like I said, I offered before anyone who didn't ask questions through you who wants to get back to us directly, um, more than happy to take those questions and uh, get that back out. Sounds great. So feel free to keep sending your questions in, and we'll get everything, uh, all the information to everyone. And I hope everyone has a fantastic day again. Jim, thanks for this great presentation. And um, I will, we will have, again, hope everyone has a great day.